We are back with the Fox News alert. The country of New Zealand has banned high-powered military-style weapons just days after the deadly mosque attack that killed 50. All right, the government is also working on a buyback program so police can destroy the guns that are there legally. Those who don't turn over their firearms could face fines and prison time. The weapons ban is expected to start next month. And we have Ben Shapiro here, editor-in-chief of The Daily Wire, host of The Ben Shapiro Show, and author of the new book, The Right Side of History, How Reason and Moral Purpose Made the West Great. Welcome, Ben. And thanks for having me. Is this a reasonable answer to the massacre that took place last week? It's an emotionally reasonable answer, but it's not a factually reasonable answer. There are some 1.2 million guns in New Zealand. In 2017, the entire country of New Zealand had 35 murders. Most of those, or at least many of those, were not with a gun in the first place. So they're now talking about criminalizing presumably hundreds of thousands of New Zealand citizens who don't turn over their guns in response to an isolated incident statistically. No matter how terrible an incident is, if it is isolated statistically, criminalizing hundreds of thousands of law-abiding people on the basis of that seems like bad policy. Well, Ben, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders has tweeted this out. This is what real action to stop gun violence looks like. We must follow New Zealand's lead, take on the NRA, and ban the sale and distribution of assault weapons in the United States. Ben? I'm old enough to remember when Democrats tried to run away from suggesting that they were pushing for a gun confiscation. Now, apparently, they're going to full-scale embrace gun confiscation. We have something called the Second Amendment in this country. It is deeply embedded in American culture, and rightly so. And again, if you're going to pick countries that are good examples of why gun confiscation is needed, New Zealand is not one of them. There are 35 murders in the entire country in 2017, a country of some 4.4 million people. So uh, Better O'Rourke's got some interesting beliefs we're finding out. Uh, it doesn't really stand on policy much, but looking at his background, he wrote a he wrote a novel just about how great it was to run over children, uh, but he was a kid then. And then he also was part of a hacking group, but we didn't find about that until recently. Uh, and then we find out that he likes to eat dirt for revitalization, dirt from New Mexico. And then we find out where he stands on late-term abortions. Let's see if we could see a position here. You were asked about late-term abortions just before. I'm wondering specifically, if you had won the election last November and if you were in the U.S. Senate a couple days ago, how would you have voted on that bill? I would have listened to the women. I would have listened to doctors and, and medical providers. Uh, I would have looked at the, at the facts and, and understood um, the truth. And, and then I would have voted uh, with those women to make their own decisions about their own bodies. Ben, we're talking about a, a fully functioning, now viable baby. I'm still confused, as a woman, why people are talking about women's rights in relation to a child that now has its own rights. Is this really what Democrats want to be pushing? I mean, it really is quite insane. The fact that, that Beto O'Rourke and every other major Democrat feel forced to embrace this position, that you have to be for abortion up to and sometimes beyond the point of birth, right. it just demonstrates the radicalism of the Democratic Party. Even Beto's generalized position, which is that in the third trimester, abortion should be legal. Forget about the infanticide position. Even the third trimester position is a position that only 13 percent of Americans hold. This is far out of the mainstream, far more out of the mainstream than generalized pro-life views on the Republican side of the aisle. And it is amazing to watch the media treat it as though it is mainstream to suggest that women have a right to kill fully formed babies. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, you are out in California. Uh, it was a number of weeks ago. There was uh, somebody who was doing some recruiting for Turning Point USA, and they were assaulted, and now charges have been filed against a, a non-student out there. The president, later today, Ben, is going to sign an executive order on free speech on college campuses and how important it is. Who is this going to help? Well, presumably it will help people on college campuses who are trying to exercise their free speech and are prevented from doing so by the administration. I think the real question, as with all executive orders, is how is it legally drawn up? Just the mm -hmm. lawyer in me wants to know that the Constitution is being followed, that all of the laws are being uh, are being used, and that this isn't sort of an overreach. But I, I don't know that until I've seen the text. The generalized idea of protecting the First Amendment by connecting, for example, university funding for research to mm -hmm. their ad adherence to the First Amendment, that seems perfectly acceptable to me. Right. Somebody who's gotten protested, locked out, screamed at, uh, going on college campuses, uh, you know exactly the problem. Also, uh, your new book is out. It's called The Right Side of History, How Reason and Moral Purpose Made the West Great. What do you mean reason? Are we really a reasonable people here in the West? Well, I think that the, the basis of the West is reason. The basis of the West is this notion that we are individuals made in the image of God, and this comes from the Judeo-Christian tradition, mm -hmm. and that as individuals made in the image of God, we have reasonable capacities that we ought to use to pursue virtue, which is the, the Greek idea of natural law. 
That combination between Greek natural law and Judeo-Christian values created the West. All of these thoughts are deeply embedded in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. I think one of the reasons our conflicts and, and anger levels are so high in the United States is because we've largely forgotten those roots and we've moved toward a subjective belief that our own feelings matter more than objective truth or eternal values. We're, right. We're and, seeing a lot of that about feelings, aren't we? Yeah, the self-esteem movement did an incredible amount of damage to the United States. The continued focus on how I feel today, and if you offend me, then somehow you've sinned against me or you've sinned against my identity. It's incredibly dangerous for American politics, and it actually exacerbates the identity politics and political polarization and racial polarization that you've started to see in the country. Reminds me of your facts don't care about your feelings or some version of that tweet. Looks like an off the book was an offshoot of that. <laughs> That's exactly right. At least I hope so. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Thanks.